Uh, today's March 31st, 1997. Uh, the interviewer is Shulamit Bestaki, and I'm conducting interview with the ex-sergeant of U.S. Army, William McKinney. Interviews conducted in English in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, United States. Would you please uh, tell me your first and your last name and spelling, please? William N. McKinney. And you want me to spell it? W-I-L-L-I-A-M. N is in Nathaniel. McKinney, M-C, capital K-I-N-N-E-Y. Uh, did you have any, or do you have any nicknames? Bill. And that spelling of that is? B-I-L-L. -L. Uh, when were you born? February 1, 1923. And how old does it make you? 74. And what city and state were you born? I was born in the state of Pennsylvania in Uniontown. And can you give us the spelling of the city where you were born? U-I-O-N T-O-W-N And it's state of Pennsylvania? In the state in, of Pennsylvania. In country of USA? Country USA. Uh, can you describe to us uh, your family? Tell us a little bit about your early childhood where you grew up. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I come from a family of six boys and four girls. And what, the, what did your parents do? My parents, uh, my mother was a housekeeper in our home, and my father, he worked various jobs. He, was, he served in World War I, and he was gassed, and he worked various jobs to try to raise the family. You said he was gassed. Can you uh, explain that more? What? Well, he fought in the trenches in France with the 377th Infantry Division. And during World War I, they were using different types of gas, mainly mustard gas. And uh, as a consequence, he was gas in those trenches. He survived this? He survived, and they lived to be 94. How did it affect uh, his life uh, experiencing this in, 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 the, in the first war? Was, did it affect his health? I said he was gassed, and he, uh, when he died, he died with some sort of kidney failure. Can you describe the community where you lived uh, in Uniontown? I was brought away from Uniontown when I was 10 months old. So it would be very difficult for me to describe it. You said you grew up in Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. Can you describe to us a little bit your life with your other siblings, your brothers and sisters? Well, it was uh, compatible. We had a home that was full of love, and we were all hard workers. And we had time for play, play and work. Where were you in your, among your siblings of the ten brothers and sisters? Well, 
I was next to the baby boy. Uh, I had three other brothers older than I. And can you describe your your childhood? Uh, what kind of things you did when you were growing boy in Pittsburgh? Well, we'd go out in the woods. We lived in Penn Township, Penn Hills today they call it. My baby brother and I go out in the woods and pick elderberries, apples and so forth. My mother would make elderberry jelly and apple jelly and applesauce and so forth. And Can you describe the house where you lived with your family? Was it a big house, small house? It was a large house. How, how, many, how many rooms? How big of a house was it? Oh, um, Eight rooms. The area where you lived, uh, was it, uh, uh, what kind of a neighborhood was it? Well, it was a mixed neighborhood. Like, Mix, mixed in what way? Well, it was both black and white family. And we all got along. And what kind of holidays did you celebrate together with your family? Well, the uh, normal Christian holidays. We Christmas, Easter, Fourth of July, Independence Day, Memorial Day. When what kind of high school did you go to, excuse me, school you went to? Was it a racially mixed? Uh, what, what was it like for it you? It was racially mixed. How were you treated uh, in, in, in high school? What year was it when you went to school? Oh, well, in 1939, 41. Can you describe for us a little bit of your, your high school years? Well, when I went to high school, I wasn't no A student, but uh, just a mediocre student. And the thing that fascinated me most was the sciences biology and uh, physics. Did I you, enjoyed those subjects most. Did you take part in any uh, activities after school? No. What did you do for fun? Well, my baby brother and I, we would play together. Did you travel? Not when I was a youngster, no. So wh <clears throat> what happened after you finished high school? Well, I went off to the military. That was in 1943. 1943? Yes. How old were you when you went to the military? I was 18, turning 19. Can you describe for us what was it when you graduated from high school and uh, uh, when you were, was, were you drafted? Yes. Can you describe this thing for us? Well, I was drafted. My family had moved from Penn Township to uh, Shelley Heights District. Off on Center Avenue, and uh, I was graduated from 
draft board number five at Heron Hill Junior High School. And that's why we went and drafted into the military June 6, 1943. Before you were drafted, when you were still in high school, did you experience uh, racism in school or in your area where you lived? Can you describe that for us a little bit? Well, I didn't experience anything out of the ordinary. It was racially mixed and balanced. And, uh, Racial mix and what? Racially mixed and balanced. Balanced. Yes. So you did not, you did not have any major problem related to race in high school? No. Okay, can you go now with us chronologically? Uh, what was it like on the day that you were drafted, that you were taken to the army? Well, the day that I was drafted, there were many young men down at the draft board downtown at the old post office building, downtown Pittsburgh, at the old post office building. And there were oh, about oh, a little over 300 men there, young men. And they're all ranging in age from 18 to 25. And what happened? Well, they gave us various tests and so forth. And one test in particular that they gave was uh, communication. And I scored the highest out of all the men. And it was Morse code. And then they put me in the uh, Air Base Security Battalion. What was that? To transmit there was a Camp Rucker, Alabama. When you were drafted, can you describe to us what was the date like when you changed from the civilian to the military men and they said you said goodbye to your families? What can you describe that for us? Yes, uh, I had said goodbye to my mother and dad and my uh, two other brothers and myself. We went to downtown to the B and O station to ship out for various designations. And uh, my fiance, she was there along with her sister. She was a twin. And she uh, saw me off. And I told her, I said, I would get married, but it wouldn't be fair to my mother. Because they, on induction, they, uh, each soldier was insured for $10,000. And I said, if anything happened to me, we wouldn't have not been married long enough for your entitlement to this $10,000. And I said, my mother has done more for me up to this point. So I named my mother as the beneficiary if anything should happen to me. And then as I promised her after the war, we got married. And from the marriage, we had three sons. 
Uh, let's go a little bit earlier uh, before we go to the period after the war. Did you go to basic training? Yes, I did. Can you describe that for us a little bit? Well, I arrived at Fort Meade, Maryland, and uh, got the uh, necessary inoculation shots. And uh, then from Fort Meade, I was shipped to Camp Wrecker, Alabama. And my other brother, one was sent to Port Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And my baby brother was sent to Camp in Michigan, I don't remember just what the name of the camp was. And can you describe the, the basic training for us? Well, at first, uh, the outfit that I was in, the lowest rank was uh, corporal technician. They had all technical corporal sergeants and master sergeant, first sergeant. And now um, I was put under, uh, they gave us a test uh, again. Uh, they had narrowed it down to 76 men. And out of the 76, I scored the highest again for communication. Was and this Morse code again? Morse code. Then they uh, uh, put me under the direct learning techniques of a Sergeant Younger. What is a direct learning technique? Oh, uh, it's uh, more or less he was going to teach me the ins and outs of Morris Code. And uh, I started it more with a bigger part of my days were spent with him learning the ins and outs of Morse code. Um, was this part of the, of the basic training? This was part of the, my basic training. Then they had these air base security battalions in North Africa and two or three of them had got wiped completely out. Uh, see, air base security battalion was similar to the infantry. It was supposed to guard the airfields. And so uh, they broke the air base security battalions up and transferred us all into the quartermaster. And that's from there. I was only at Camp Rucker about a month. That was in Alabama? Alabama. Then they sent us to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And that was a hellhole. That's where I began to experience a great deal of prejudice and indifference and so forth, and name calling and so forth. Can you describe it for us, give us examples? Well, when they, all of us here in trucks, when the trucks pulled up on the base, I saw these beautiful white barracks. And I saw it in, you know, manicured lawns. I thought, oh, this is a nice camp. They drove by the barracks and took us down to the back end of the camp. And they had these little four by four black huts 
no windows. They had uh, panels that they would raise and lower. You know, it was screened. When it was hot, you just raised it during the day. If it was a cool night, you lower it. And I think the slept six to a bear. And then we encountered some difficulties with the white civilians and the white soldiers. In what what kind of difficulties? Well name calling and and then there were fights that broke out. And Can you give us an example of how, what kind of words they use towards the black soldiers? Well, they would call us niggers and blacky and all sorts black of... Black what? Blackies. Nigger, you know, all sorts of uh, name calling, and how spit at us, and so forth. Were this the white fellow soldiers? White soldiers. See, the soldiers weren't integrated then. They had all black outfits and all white outfits. And so we had a colonel, his name was Colonel Castle. He was a battalion commander. Was he white or black? He was a white man. How did he treat you? Oh, he treated us. He was a good man. And so because Colonel Castle, he was the one that was responsible to have our outfit transferred out of Camp Shelby, Mississippi, because he called Washington, D.C., a uh, high command in Washington, told him if he didn't ship us out of there, he would not be held responsible for what would happen. He was going to arm the battalion. Army battalion? He was going to arm us, arm the battalion, and let them go up against these white soldiers. So uh, it was only there three weeks. Then they shipped us to Camp Forest, Tennessee. Uh, that's where I completed my basic training at Camp Forest, Tennessee. And how was the treatment to you as being black American there? At Camp Forest? It was somewhat similar, but wasn't as bad as it was in Mississippi. The, uh, you encountered a lot of prejudice in the South, well, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, all the states where they had these camps. Did you have time? segregated. Did you have a time to go out of the base and socialize with the uh, local population? Yes. You get passes and go into town. In that camp forest, you had Chattanooga you could go to, or Memphis. Can you describe what it was like for you to go on, on the on the leave out of your base? Uh, how were you treated? Well, generally as a rule, we would find black communities, and we were treated well. Uh, a lot of places I had read about when I was in school, when I had gone past, uh, my chief interest was to see these places, visit these places. Like my hair was well, a black university there in Tennessee, in Nashville. And I go out there and meet with different persons. And and there was a Jackson tea room. I'd go there and have lunch. Were you and free? Stayed to at the YMCA. 
were you free to go to any type of restaurants or was it also segregated down south? Oh, well, in the white community they had their restaurants and in the black community they had their restaurants. So were you able to go to a white restaurant in south? No. You were not? No. Most of the restaurants that I frequent when I went into town were black. Well, we are coming to the end of this uh, tape and we will continue on the next tape. To uh, interviewing, interviewing William McKinney. Is there anything that uh, we may not have covered in the previous tape that comes to your mind that you would like to speak about, Mr. McKinney? Well, when we boarded the train and left Pittsburgh, uh, our first stop was Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, they had prepared lunch for us. So, it was a warm day, and we had some of the windows open. So this one white fellow is walking by, and he said, why are you stopping here? He asked the conductor, and the conductor said, oh, to feed that bunch of nigger soldiers back here. So, the uh, officer that was on the train, well, this not fellas just ignore it and remain calm because we were getting ready to. Because what? Because we were getting ready to get our, off of that train and give him a shellacking. So uh, we just ignored it. And he told us that the officer, he was a white officer, he told us that you're going to encounter a lot of unpleasant remarks now that you're in the South, as you have to realize that. So the train that took you to, to your basic training, this were all, were this uh, all black soldiers, young, yes. young recruits? Right. You black were soldier. traveling together? Yes. You were not put together with, were you put together with white uh, recruits? No. Is there anything else that comes to your mind that you would like to mention during that uh, period that we were speaking of uh, in the first tape during your recruiting period? You would like to give us some example, further example of, uh, of your personal experience uh, with racism in, during that time? Well, they uh, had a situation there when we were at Camp Forest, Tennessee, after they had switched us from Airway Security to Quartermaster. They'd take us down to the railhead. To where? To the railhead, they call it. This expression that they used. What is that? It's like a uh, depot. In the railroad. They'd take us, load us on trucks, take us down there, and we'd uh, work unloading these boxcars and things. Then they had them, they were shipping food and stuff in for all the whole base. Then they had a big bake for you, and they'd bake this bread. And, I, uh, and then I would get a loaf of this hot bread and uh, get me a pound of butter and just smear this butter in this hot bread and eat it, make a meal off of it. And uh, then we'd work and they'd take us back to camp at evening, our quarter, our area. and. And at that time, there were a lot of, you'd pass these white women, and 
one day. The authorities came. He says, you have to stop that group bunch of nigger soldiers from eyeball raping these women. He called it eyeball rape. So, eyeball raping these white women, that's the way he put it. So, the commanding officer said they have eyes. If the women don't want to be seen, you have to remove the women off the camp off of this base. So I uh, just took it lightly and paying attention to it, just ignored it. I said these people are ignorant. And to me I say ignorance is bliss. How did you respond to other type of uh, uh Verbal words. Well, I never allow it to annoy me. I said, now if they want to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. Because they're ignorant, I'm not going to be ignorant. So, how long were you at this basic uh, training? When did it finish? Uh, we shipped out of Karen Forest at the. Uh, Let's see. That would have been March of 44. March of 44, it was sent to Camp Shank, New York, to be shipped over to Europe. And how did you travel to New York? By trains? By train. And how long were you there? Um, about two weeks. And what did you do during those those two weeks? Well, I took a bus down to Philadelphia with a fellow soldier uh, because I had not gotten a furlough. I was the only soldier in the outfit that didn't get a furlough. I was in the hospital at the time there. Uh, what happened? Gave 15 day furloughs. You said you were in the hospital? Yes. What happened? Well, I was having trouble with my eyes, and the doctors were trying to find out just what was causing the difficulty. You see, uh, well, were you? Did you have a problem seeing with yes, vision? vision? Yes, vision. I think my vision was um, seventy over sixteen in one eye and sixty over forty in the other eye. Because when I went into the military, I wanted to get in the Marine Corps and. My face, they took the Marines to turn me down, so my vision was too poor for Marines. So, when were you uh, shipped from New York to, to overseas? Well, it seemed that would have been. Two weeks after we arrived at Camp Shank, New York. Then at first we were scheduled to go on the Queen Mary then they changed the orders and we went up on a Liberty ship. SS MacAndrew. SS? MacAndrew. Liberty ship. We went over on the Liberty ship and returned on the Liberty ship. And where did you go on the ship? Over, over to where? To Liverpool, England. And how long of a journey was it? Oh, it 
took us 12 days, 12 days to go over and 14 days coming back. And can you describe to us what happened when you landed in Liverpool, England? Well, they boarded us on trains and took us to a town, the air car up in Scudimore. To where? Up in Scudimore. What is that? It was a town in England. And uh, we continued uh, in basic training there. Then they took us to from Were you still in England segregated? No. I think it was different. Can you describe it? How different? How different was it? Well, the people were much nicer. They knew that we had come over to assist in defeating the Nazis. Can you give an example of how differently you were treated? Well, when we get passes and go into town, a different town, it was, uh, we were received very warmly. The different pubs, you go into town and go to the pub and get fish and chips. They, they have fish and chips and a cup of tea for meals, you know, noon meals over there, big fish and chip years over there. When you get them, um, So how long were you in England? I was in England about three or four weeks before crossing the channel. And, and you were still uh, segregated units with the white children? Or? Yes. And the white soldiers, they took a lot of that prejudice over there and they would tell the Englishmen that we were monkeys and that if they go out at night so we had a tail, and we would be swaying through the trees with our tail. And so, one instant, this, uh, I think it was a corporal, and I outfit had gone to town and passed. And this English girl uh, asked him to see his tail. And so he said, you want to see my tail? And he unbuckled his belt and dropped his pants. <laughs> Plus his undergarment. And he said, now you see my tail? She said, no, I don't see your tail. He said, well, you ain't see my tail. That's the only tail I got. You know? So the white MPs, they arrested him and brought him back to camp. And we had a colonel there that was in charge of that outfit. He told him, if you take this soldier back to town, and he told the black soldier, he says, now, if they ask to see your tail again, you do the same exact thing. Show them your tail because they they had spread, the white soldiers had spread all sorts of rumors about us to the Englishmen. Some of them were unintelligent enough to believe 
these things. And, but you think there were some intelligent people, a lot of intelligent people, and they didn't believe they took it with a grain of salt. They just ignored it. But those are some of the things I encountered in England. And then the ship to Southampton. Southampton? Yes. Southampton. What part of England is that? It's right on the channel, the English Channel. As far as you could see, there's nothing but soldiers. There's Green. nothing but what? But soldiers? Soldiers. Getting ready to cross the English Channel into France. How narrow was that channel, the crossing? Oh, I don't know. You could look out across the Saint Channel and see the coast of France. You could see from North Southampton, you could see yes. the French shore? Yes. And how did you cross it? On LST. What is that? That was these uh, boats that they would have, small boats that they would have where they put so many tanks and trucks and the soldiers on. And whenever they hit the beach, they'd lower the front end of it. And the soldiers would mark that, walk down a ramp. Run down a ramp onto the beach, and you stand in Southampton, the English side of the channel, and see those LSTs when they lower that door. The Germans had that 88. They had what? What is 88? It's a big cannon. They fired at 88, and you see jeeps and bodies flying in the air, and full colonels and majors, and all these supposed to be macho men, cried like babies, and they had MPs there with sub Thompson machine guns making them go up by their boats because you should carry this in the face of the enemy. You're supposed to be shot by your fellow soldiers and they'd make them go up. And you went too? I didn't cry, I got on you. No, you had to go too? Oh, yes. And from what happened from there, what did, which direction did you go, or your, your unit went to? We went to Omaha Beach, across the channel. Can, can you describe that, what was that like? Uh, well, it was, uh, well, I'll just say it was hell. It was hell. What do you remember from that, on, on that day when you landed on Omaha Beach? Well, it was raining. What day was that? I don't remember the exact day. The year? That would have been 44. Can you describe that day? Oh, wait a minute, that was June the 8th. June 8th, 1944. It was two days after D-Day. D-Day was the 6th of June. What was that like for you? Well, shells and bullets were flying everywhere. And Did you lose any of your friends? Uh, not there, but as we advance, some of them are lost. So, how long were you on Omaha Beach? Oh, we landed. It was a downpour, we had buckets of water falling out of the sky. Then, See, they gave us these uniforms that were supposed to have been impregnated. And uh, they, uh, 
in spite of the impregnation of the uniform, I was drenched to my skin. And uh, when we got to the bivouac area where we were going to bivouac at night, we had to march 15 miles inland. And when we got to this bivouac area, you couldn't strike a match or nothing at night. Fear that a German plane was spotted bomb the area or come down and scrape the area, whichever. And uh, so I just took my tent shelter half. You took what? My see, they they they, they put two soldiers together in each squad. And one carried half of the tent shelter. And the other one carried the other half. And when they reach a bill like the area, they'll take the two halves and put them together. So I just took my half and rolled up in it on the ground. And I was soaked to my skin. <coughs> <coughs> and then uh, the next morning, we got up and built a big bonfire, tried to dry our clothing out. And I drew, dried my clothing out. And there was, oh, that was my new, the conditions under which I had to sleep. Uh, as we advance, uh, uh, I um, slept on the ground where it was snow, or tried to sleep, you know, just rest. And the snow, rain, whatever the weather conditions were. So that was still in, in, in Omaha Beach? No, that's as we advanced. So when well, they... Well, the first... See, our outfit word was attached. We were called, referred to as combat service or supply. And what was the number of that... Of, of that uh, Nine, seven, eight. And then... We went in, we were attached to the different divisions. When we went in on Omaha Beach, we were attached to the Rangers. The Rangers were made up of hardened criminals. And if they lived through it, they'd go on the establishing beachheads, and if they lived through it, they got their freedom. But they were only allowed them to establish beachhead. They wouldn't allow them going to the cities and town, because there were bank robbers, safe crackers, and everything else in the Rangers. And they were supposed to be hardened like a Marine. Uh, killers, stone killers. They took them, where did they get them from? From the prisons here in the United States, the Alcatraz and all those prisons. That's what they were. And so then after that, when they pulled them out, uh, we were attached to the 1st Division. We went in the first French town on the fall of the side. What was the name of the French town? St. Lo. St. Lo? St. Lo. S-T-L-O. St. Lo. That was the first French town to fall. And uh, we went in with the first division, pushed us out. Germans pushed us back out. Then, whilst the first division was regrouping, they sent us in with the 29th Infantry Division. The 29th Infantry Division went in and retook St. Lowe and Hell 
And after they had retook St. Louis, there was one side of one building standing like that. Everything else was rubble. Then, from St. Lo, how far, wh which direction did your unit go? Your combat uh, supply in the 978 go? We went up from St. Lo to Nugent, all those towns in Central. What, what, in what part of France was it? Normandy. Normandy? Yes. And I had read about Normandy in the geography books and so forth. And I um, had the opportunity to see it and see how those people lived. And then I. How did they treat you there? Well, uh, they treated us all right. It was difficult. Uh, but you take a lot of people in Normandy, um, even to this day, dislike what the Americans did because we had to tear up towns, you know, routing those Germans, those Nazis out of there. And they didn't like us for tearing up your towns because at least their towns were intact when the Germans occupied. And uh, I guess some of the older people that are still living that had lived through it still resent what we did. But we had to do. We had no uh, no uh, other alternative but to do it. So from there, which direction did you go? Well, we headed to Paris. St. Genevieve de Bois is many towns, little small towns and hamlets. Every went in cross through. And you know, see that army. What was your specific task? What did you do? I was the officer's orderly. We call it my eyes. They figured, see, the commanding officer told me my eyes was too weak, too bad to be out there on the battlefield. And so most time I spent around guarding the command post with the soldiers that were at camp, whilst the other soldiers went out and worked. We're coming to the end of this tape, and we'll continue. Uh, this is tape three, interviewing uh, William McKinney. Mr. McKinney, uh, in the previous tape, you were speaking of uh, being in Paris and other French cities. Uh, what direction did your unit uh, has gone from Paris? How long after, were you? after we left Paris, we went into Liège, Belgium. And how did you get? How did you travel there? By truck. Military trucks. Yes. Military convoys were these. Yes. And um, how long was that of a trip to Belgium? I don't know the exact mileage. Was it a day? How, how long did you travel? Oh, it was less than a day. And what happened in Belgium? Well, in Belgium, uh, St. Louis fell first. And... Fell to whom? To the American troops, the United States First Army. The United States First Army was the lead army under General Hodges and General Omar and Bradley. And Liege fell in a little town that nestled in between Nesson, Boo, and Verbery. Verbery was the next. See, we were on the move when um, 
a lot of these little towns and things that we passed through, I don't remember the names of them all. Then, after the age of Burberry, then we went to a town called Reardon. What was it? Reardon. Uh, is it still, was it still? R-E-A-D-O-N. Uh, was it still in Belgium? Yes. It was part, uh, it was on the uh, Belgian-German border. And uh, it was just outside of Aachen, Germany. Aachen, Germany was the first German town to be decided to fall. Uh, Twelve hours after Aachen fell, our outfit was in Aachen. Then from Auckland, we went and crossed the Rhine. When we crossed the Rhine, Duisburg, Dusseldorf, Duren, Baden-Baden, Jena, Gotha, all of these German towns, nothing but shells or buildings, in the wake of that first army. And from Reardon, they had these big guns, uh, 75 millimeters, 105 millimeters, 155 millimeters, 175 millimeters, 205 millimeters. Uh, 205 would shoot 23 miles accurately on a clear day. Who had those guns? The these American guns. And I was right up under those guns. And uh, where fired them. I hope the traders was in there as wide as this room when they fired those guns. And uh, they were shelling across the Rhine. What was it like for you to, to, to hear this shelling? Oh, it was nerve wracking. It was really nerve wracking. Did you at any time in your experience have direct contact with the German? Soldier, did you uh, have any of that experience? Yes. Can uh, you describe it? Well, after the Germans surrendered, uh, they had set up points where they had compounds for these prisoners, German prisoner of war. And outfit marks them back to these compounds. And uh, and during the Battle of the Ball that was when uh, Hitler amassed this big army and pushed us back to the channel. And the, they pushed a ridge in the point of the United States First Army. And until this day, a, a strategy on the American part, they let them push in. Then Patton came up from the right flank. The Ninth Army came down on the left flank, and they had well, uh, the Germans surrounded in a pocket, and they came out of there out of thousands. See, Hitler had amassed this big army under General von Rundstadt, and uh, then, uh, until this day, I believe that. Uh, there was military strategy on the high command of the United States Army. So did you at any time when you were in Germany uh, have reached point of where there were any concentration camps or extermination camps? Oh yes, when we reached Weimar, Germany, that's where, that's the town I was in when the war ended May 8th. 
Because they had this camp bosom ball. That's <coughs> right. They had this camp bosom ball. And there were um, well, thousands of uh, Jewish refugees. Can you describe? in greater detail when you entered the camp. What did you see? Well... And what was it like for you? Well, I saw... It was a deplorable condition, this camp. I saw these Jewish refugees dressed in uh, blue and gray striped light you know, for them to look like pajamas. They look like what? Pajamas. And uh, then they had other prisoners of war and mixed in with them. What these people? British and Americans that had been captured. Can you describe the physical condition of, uh, of those prisoners? Oh, their eyes were sunken in, and their faces were sunken in. They tried to look like skeletons with just skin over. And I, uh, there were two little Jewish Jewish boys. Uh, I gotta go to the restroom. Where's the restroom? Uh, Mr. McKinney, before you begin to speak of the two Jewish boys, uh, let's go back to the camp itself. Can you tell me we what were kind in of no camps? We were on the battlefields. But in the in the Buchenwald itself, what else did you see inside of the camp? I saw lampshades made from human skin, and then I saw. Um, Moles of the different parts of airplanes, every nut, bolt, and screw, and wire. And the Stuka fighter plane, the Messerschmitt 118, the Messerschmitt 119. Was that in Buchenwald? Uh, at Weimar. Just outside of Buchenwald. Now, let's go again uh, to the Buchenwald itself. Have you seen uh dead bodies in, in Buchenwald? Oh yes. It, it had one dead, two alive, two or three dead bodies laying there. But see I didn't bother with any of those bodies because we gave them the live ones K ration and kill them. And the medics came and said we shouldn't give them no K ration. They hadn't had anything salt to eat in such a long time that it would kill them. And uh, then they had to feed them intravenously when the medics came in until they could get the strength until they could get enough strength to eat solid food. Did you see anything else in the camp proper? Did you see any uh, gas chambers or uh, what, what else did you see? Oh yes, the uh, sort of pit where they march them up and shoot them and fall down in the pit. You see what? The pit. And what did where you see they there? They march them up and shoot them and them fall over in the pit. You saw the Germans doing it? I didn't see the Germans when they did it, no. But you saw, what I saw was the aftermath, after we had conquered the uh, German troops and run them out of there. This was the aftermath of what I seen. Did you, how young were the people, how old were the people, or how young were the people I, that you I, saw? I don't know. Did you see uh, children there? 
Yes. Who survived? Yes. You were speaking before of the two Jewish boys. Can you continue with that story? Yes, there were two little Jewish boys. As close as I can remember, their names were Paul and Joy. One was about four, one was about six. And you know, when we, we had a field uh, there where we set up a field kitchen, and then after the soldiers would eat what they want, some of them had too much. They just throw it over in the garbage can, remain it. And these two little boys were digging down in the garbage can with their hands, eating this food. I told them, no, no. So uh, I communicated with them to the best of my ability, try to get them to understand. And we finally got to a brief point where we understood each other. Then I. I let the one eat. I went and got a basket of food and let the one eat. And after he finished, and I got the message, refilled the mess, went through the line again, refilled the message, and gave it to the other one. And they were clinging to me for two days. And then we had to move on. And I wanted to adopt them. And they, uh, the authorities told me, no, that they had set up orphanage for these children. Displaced persons, displaced children. Do you know I where they were from? What country they were from? No. No, all I knew I got out of them was that they had made them stand and watch when they marched their mother and father into this furnace to be burnt alive. Into what? To be burnt alive. That's what I told you? That's what I got out of it. Is that how their parents were killed? That's how they became, yes, that's how they became burnt They were became burnt alive? Is that burnt what you said? alive. Did they say where? Was it at, at? No, they didn't say where. I just assume that it was the furniture of that boom ball. I don't know. See, I didn't have time to go into a whole lot of particulars with the people that I encountered over here. I was over there to do a job. What What was your job in Buchenwald? What was my job in Buchenwald? Mm -hmm. What kind of things you did? The same things that I did all the way through. I didn't have no specific tasks in Buchenwald. See, they had great registration companies to handle dead bodies in that. And I was not in no grave registration. I thought I made myself explicitly clear that I was in the 978 Combat Services Supply. We had no ammunition, shells for the artillery, and small arms, 50 caliber, machine guns, rifle bullets, rifles. What have you? Do you remember when you entered Buchenwald, how did those who were still alive respond when they saw you, American and other American soldiers? Oh, they were exuberant to see the Americans run those Germans out of there. And, that, and I understand that they no longer had to be confronted with the autocracies that the Germans was committing against them. Can you tell me what was it like for you to see all this, this slim, skinny 
individuals uh, in those striped uniforms. What was it like for you when you saw that? What well, went through your mind? Well, it was the most deplorable thing that I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I would want to see that again. Until then, uh, you were enlisted, you were drafted in 43. Until 1943, have you heard when you were still uh, a, I guess, teenager, what was going on in Europe? Have I, have uh, I read? What, what, what news, kind of the news media. Yeah, what kind of things did you hear? Well, I guess the same thing that everybody else here on the news about all the turmoil and unrest over there in Europe. Because when I was over there, I thought that after we defeated those Nazis, that would the war that would end all wars. Have you heard of, uh, in 1943, have you heard of the concentration camps by then? Have I heard anything about the concentration camps? N yeah, n by 1943? Oh, yes. The news media, the radio, and newspapers, magazines. So people were informed what was going on in Europe? Oh yes, the blitzkrieg and all that. Yes, I heard it on the news and read about it in the papers. Did they describe, uh, did they give some uh, examples of uh, of what was uh, happening to 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 the Jewish people and other nationalities of the brutalities in in uh, in Europe? Yes. So tell me, you were there in? Uh, by well, the they explain on the news he's here and read in the newspaper about the Blitzkriegs when. Nazis was uh, invading all those countries in Europe and how they were persecuting the Jews. So you were in Buchenwald for how many days? For two days? Two days. And this is how long you have been with the two boys? I didn't stay in Buchenwald. I saw Buchenwald, went through Buchenwald. I was in Weimar, just uh, the boom wall was just outside of Weimar. Can you describe a little bit more those two boys? What did they look like, these two boys, uh, short, small, tall? How did they look like? Well, just like a normal child, what age did they, four, five, and six, or four and six. What did they wear? They, uh, had some civilian clothing on. They didn't have the pajamas. They had a regular little outfit for a boy. There you go. How much time did you spend with them the, during those two days? Well, whenever meal time would come around, well, I would get them. They knew when we were serving food. They would come, and I would get food for them. And you had to move out of the, your base. Uh, how did they feel about you having let, let go, needing, uh, needing to go? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, did, did you say goodbye to them? Yes, I did. Do you remember that uh, moment? What, what did they do when you had to say goodbye? Do you remember that? Well, they grabbed onto my legs when I had to say goodbye. I told them I have to go, but we're moving on. They get they they wouldn't let go of your legs. No, they grabbed hold of my legs. Each one was clinging to each one of my legs. Was that difficult for you? No. I just pat them on their shoulder, their head. So I have to go. And what happened after? The you? older one understood more. I said, I'm well over here fighting the war. I don't have time to <laughs> play nursemaid to you youngsters. So what was the next uh, uh, 
stage for, for your unit? Where did you go next? The town called Erford. What was it? Erford. Erford? Yeah, E-F-F-E-R-T. Erford, Germany. And how long were you there? Oh, well, when the war ended, uh, I was in Erford about a month. About a month. When the war ended, I was still at Weimar. See, the war ended May 8th, and I was in Weimar, Germany. Do you remember the day when the, the, the declaration of end of war was made? I said May 8th. What was that like when you heard that the war is over? Uh, well, I felt very exhilarated that the war had ended. And what did you do next? Well, we went to Erfurt, as I said, and then our outfit was transferred over to uh, the occupation force. What occupation force? The occupation forces. Uh, we had occupied Germany, and we had to set up, assist in setting up the American military zone. They had the Americans, the French, the Russian, and the four zones. The American, French, Russian, and the British. War is a different zone. And now, uh, they, they, they had to leave troops there in these occupied zone to uh, make sure there was no more uprisings. So I was attached to the occupation forces. And how long were you there? Well, it started in Erfurt, then it moved us to Hirschfeld, Germany. See, like I said, I had seen much. The Audubon, even traveled the Audubon. That's where they got the idea of turnpikes here in the United States from Elvada Bar built with slave labor, a travel and everything. So, and there's, see, it's very difficult to remember in many detail. It would take <coughs> quite some time for me to explain everything that I had participated in the towns and things that I had seen. Well, we're coming to the end of this tape and we'll continue on the next. And we should This is tape four, uh, interviewing William McKinney. Mr. McKinney, is there anything else that you would like to mention on that we have not discussed in previous tape, particularly uh, related to the Camp Buchenwald that you have seen, that you may not have mentioned, mentioned in the previous tape? Well, I saw most of the autocracies. Most of what? War-related autocracies that were committed by the SS and uh, the German army. The works mass, they call it. What kind of other things have you seen? Have you met any of the Germans in a camp uh, in Buchenwald itself? Have you had any encounter with them? The in, soldiers? In, uh, in, any Germans in a. Oh, in a, yes, I met so, and talked with Germans. 
But did they have any response to what happened at Buchenwald? Uh, they, many of them just seemed to turn a deaf ear to it. They didn't want to hear about it. The civilians that I met over there, and many of them were aware of it, and many of them were not aware of what was going on in those concentration camps. You spoke of uh, seeing a lampshade made out of human skin. Is yes. there anything else that uh, you have seen that uh, uh, kind of caught your attention? You see, you had brains pickled in formaldehyde, hearts pickled in formaldehyde, preserved. You have seen that? Oh, yes. Where was this? Where did you see it? At Camp Buchenwald. Was it in some kind of a laboratory? Where was it? Was it was a laboratory. Well, when were you discharged? Um, December 17, 1945. And when, when did you, back before discharge, you, were you discharged in the States or were you still in, in Europe? In the States. So when did you get back to, to the States? Uh, uh, December 15, 1945. And you were discharged? From in town Gap, Pennsylvania. And what was it like to, to return home to, to the States after the war and after seeing concentration camp atrocities? Well, whenever we arrived in the States, they had a big, um, Dinner prepare for us at, uh, in the town gap. Steak dinner, potatoes, vegetables, and so forth. But there was something that my body was crying for. It wasn't no meat and potatoes. Milk. Milk? Yeah. And this mess sergeant told me that most of the soldiers coming back was craving this milk fresh milk, because we had used powder milk the whole time we were over here. And I took a number 56 dipper, which is about a quart, and I stood there. They had a big 20-gallon pot with a spigot on it, merged in ice to keep it nice and cold. And I took this number 56 dipper, which is about a quart. And I drank about four of them. And there had, was no room for no staying potatoes. I just wanted milk. And when I got home, my mother was getting two quarts of milk a day for the family. I told her, put two more. I'll pay for it. Get two more quarts. So she ordered two more quarts. And as I settled down, I would get in the mornings when I get up, I'd eat a half a pound of bacon, about six eggs, and drink a quart of milk for breakfast service where I had eggs and bacon mostly. And uh, then cereals, oatmeal, and all that sort of thing. And when you came home, did you get married? You got you got married. I understand. Oh, uh, let's see. I got home in forty-five. Three years later, I got married. I married in forty-eight, October 6, nineteen forty-eight. You have children? Yes, I have three children, three boys. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about them? Well, my oldest son. What's his name? William Paul, Jr. He has a degree in architecture. He graduated University of Pennsylvania. He got his degree in architecture. Then he got his master's in ecology from Slippery Rock University. And my second son 
works for the Board of Education here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Is he a teacher? He's a teacher. He just got his certification. Oh, I guess it was last year. He was a certified teacher now. Before he was sub teaching. And your third son? What, what is your name of your second son? Christopher. And your third son? He's deceased. His name was Michael. What, what happened to him? He had muscular dystrophy. When did he pass away? About four years now. See, this Dr. Damaskin, who was in charge of research, he was under his direct observation. And Dr. Damaskin had told me the type of muscular dystrophy that he had, the life expectancy of uh, people with that type was between 35 and 40. He lived to be 38. He uh, had his degree in business administration. He was a tax accountant. He uh, worked for Internal Revenue downtown. He worked for the city in their tax division. And then when he was working for Internal Revenue, they, um, most of the other personnel working there, they would load his desk up with all this work, paperwork, whilst they goofed off at the water fountain and the coffee machine. And I told him, no, you don't need that. And so I made him give it up because any time you have a disability, uh, you automatically get $150 Social Security. And so I didn't think that was adequate for a young man, so I put him on my Social Security. And so they took so much out of my Social Security and added to it and made him get about $300 a month. Well, Mr. McKinney, it's 52 years after the war. Yes. If you would meet your two little friends who are four and six today, what would it be like? What would you say to them? I'd be delighted to meet them. I'd be, I'd be delighted to meet them. What would you say to them? Oh, you know, I would say how wonderful and fine young men you've grown up to be and so forth. And just be overwhelmed to see that they had prospered. And they what do you think they would say to you? <laughs> I have no idea. They'd probably say thank you for feeding us when we were hungry. But I doubt very seriously, I don't know where they are today. Well, you've been fighting in the war. You entered the Camp Buchenwald. Yes. Why do you think it is important to give testimony of what you have seen during the war and particularly of the atrocities, as you have said, uh, that you have seen in, in, in Buchenwald? Why is it important? Why is it important? Well, it's important to uh, let the generation come coming along know that life is not all peaches and cream and some in uh, to be a true red-blooded American sometime you have to make certain sacrifices uh, making sacrifices is not fighting among each other, 
and getting involved with the wrong people. I never dreamed that I'd see drugs and so forth destroying our communities and so forth. I never dreamed that I'd see gangsters and racketeers taking over, getting the upper hand in our communities and so forth. Even today, I, I never thought that uh, I would see the day come where every time you turn the television on, it was full of nothing but violence. Yeah. So what's the society coming to? Is there anything else you would like to say that we may not have, that you may not have spoken about before during your testimony? No. What would be, before your final message, is there anything that you would like to say what you did uh, after you were liberated uh, besides uh, having family? Did you work, what kind of work did you do? I was not liberated. No, I mean after. I mean, I mean the freed from service. Yes, I had completed my tour of duty in the military. Well, after the war in Europe, I was in the Army Reserve and came out of the Army Reserve and went back to serve an additional year assisting the wounded soldiers at the Tower General Hospital for Staten Island, returning home. And that's where I made sergeant. So when you were discharged, you were discharged with the rank of ser sergeant? No, I was discharged with the rank of PFC. I was at Howard General Hospital, where I was promoted to sergeant. Then I was, then I came out, got discharged from I was getting ready to make a career out of the army. And I got discharged because of uh, family concerns. Went to work. Yeah. I was up to be promoted to uh, master sergeant and shipped back over to Germany because of my previous experience in Germany. But uh, I turned it down. When I was discharged the second time, I turned it down to come home to assist with securing my family. What would be your message to the young people, to the world, before we end your testimony? What would you say to them, to your children and your grandchildren, your grandson? It is time to lend every effort on one's being in trying to establish peace and harmony throughout communities, throughout the United States of America and throughout the world without bloodshed. It's time that we come to our senses and eliminate bloodshed. Because war is hell. War is horrible. Thank you very much. You're welcome.